ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر الا نفسه فقال عز وجل الحمد لله الذي انزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا وقال عز وجل يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون اما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم الحمني رشدي وعزني من شر نفسي امين يا رب العالمين Today I want to talk about a difficult subject that is difficult to talk about in a khutbah but it's very easy to talk about if you have a board <coughs> and the subject is the understanding of the understanding of a legal text meaning a text a legal text in the Quran how do you understand a legal text in the Quran so that you can make legal deductions from it meaning before you make legal deductions is this hukum fard in what type of hukum is this you have to first be able to classify the text itself from a sharii point of view before you can even sharia law right you mean sharia law sharia law so so you can make deductions for islamic law or sharia law correct so <clears throat> what the scholars of Islam and I want to make a clarification here the Quran as far as dhikr is concerned as far as remembrance is concerned it's easy wa laqad yassarna al-qur'ana li dhikri we have made Quran easy for remembrance for soul searching questions for reflection for remembrance for peace of heart this at this level the quran is open to everyone the quran is, is the call of quran is for everyone but when you're making legal deductions and why am i talking about this i'm talking about this because i want us to understand that we have a very rich history we muslims we have a very rich history it is so rich it is so phenomenal that the way that they have studied the Quran as a text yani meaning the Quran has many languages you know the Quran like i said at one level it's talking about dhikr at one level the Quran is a book of dream interpretation at one level the Quran is a critique of the bible muhaimin ali at the one level the Quran is uh, talking about the la- the language of ilm al kalam Quran has many languages but the legal language of Quran is one of its greatest miracles and It is also miraculous what Muslims have been able to accomplish with this text of the Quran in terms of understanding it. So, I'm going to go over some of the legal terminologies and explain those legal terminologies in terms of how the scholars of the past they understood the passages of Quran, how they classified the passages, how they classified the text. So the first one is ibaratu nas which imam abu hanifa calls ibaratu nas and imam shafi calls this he calls it mantuq meaning something that is explicit in what is being said from naqita so it's mantuq it's logical it's clear it's it's clear in what is being said and an example of that would be for example allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the quran وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ بَيَّ وَحَرَّمَ الرِّبَا There is no ambiguity in the term Allah has made tra- trade halal and riba haram أَحَلَّ اللَّهُ بَيَّ وَحَرَّمَ الرِّبَا It's very clear, there's no, there's no need to try to figure out what is the text 
saying. There's no second guessing. As far as these words are concerned, application is a different issue. I'm talking about the text. The text is clear in its meaning. Okay? Then another example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تُقْسِطُوا فِي الْيَتَامَ If you fear that you can't do justice with the orphan girls, then go ahead, marry them to one, two, three, and, and then up to four. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا And if you fear, now here, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا If you fear you can't do justice, فَوَاحِذَا Then one is enough. Then you can have one. The text is clear in what it's saying. There's no ambiguity. There's no second translation that can be given to this word uh, for this text. In another example, إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةَ وَدَمَ وَلَحْمِ الْخِنْزِينَ Allah has made haram, maytata, the dead, the dead uh, animal. وَمَيْتَةَ uh, وَدَمَّ and then blood وَلَحْمِ الْخِنْزِيرِ and the flesh of the swine these things are haram there's no ambiguity in, which, in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means and what he's saying the speech and by the way ibaratu nas is has many definitions but one of them is the apparent meaning for which this speech is intended this is the meaning of ibaratu nas the apparent meaning it's lahir you know, in communication, they also use this word apparent meaning. Apparently, this is what he's saying. Um, but anyway, so there's ibaratun nas. There is text in the Quran that is clear. And by the way, when it comes to legal things in the Sharia, when it comes to the legal text, the scholars of Islam accept the general principle in Islam when it comes to legal text is ambiguity. Things are mudham. Things are not clear. They have to be made clear. But there are Quranic texts like Aqimul Salah, Wa Atu Zakah. It's clear what it means. But a lot of Quran, when it comes to legal uh, issues, to do this or to do that, it is not so clear. And we're going to go over some of those. So, one is it's absolutely clear what the speech is saying and what is the intention of the speech, the intent of the speech, and the speaker, in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What he's trying to say is clear in the words that's being said. Then after that, a little bit more where you have to, you know, go a little bit further. It's, it, it, you have to go a little bit further than the text. And that is called Isharatun Nas, what the meaning alludes to. Isharatun Nas is where the Hishara is. What is it pointing to? What is the point? It's pointing to something, so it's, it, it's in the text, but it's a little bit beyond the text. So let me give you an example of that. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَحِلَّ لَكُمْ لَيْلَةُ الصِّيَامِ رَفَسُوا إِلَى نِسَائِكُمْ Allah says in the Quran that, you know, it's halal for you to approach your wives in the night of Ramadan. Okay? And I don't want to go into deeper translation. We have kids over here. But the point is that it's clear that if you are going to fast the next day and you are in junub, you are in the state of impurity, you haven't had purity yet, so and you're in the state of junub, it doesn't break your fast. Meaning that the text doesn't say that, but it's clear the text means that. The text didn't say that, but the text means that. In the same way, I just want to give you another example. The Prophet ﷺ said about Eid al-Fitr. He said, give them so they will not beg this day. Give them so they will not beg this day. The, it doesn't say it, but it means give to the poor so that they will not beg this day. This day meaning Eid. So they, it, the intent of the speaker is known, but the words are not as clear. So one is, the text is extremely clear. This is called uh, Ibaratun uh, This is called Ibaratun Nas. If it is a little bit less clear, but the intent is understood, but the, the word, maybe something is missing from the words, this is called Isharatun Nas. Then another example is, more than this, is Dalalatun Nas. What is the Dalala of the Nusus? What is the, the Nusus trying to say? What is its intent? So I'll give you some examples of that. The Quran says, do not say to your parents, uff. Right? But does it mean only don't say uff? No. It means also don't 
uh, curse at them, don't say, don't annoy them. But the word is only uf. But the meaning is understood that it doesn't mean only uf. It means something more. It means don't even do that. And anything more than that, don't do that. So, but the words, if you only take the words, apparent words, then you would not understand what the text is saying. So, what is my point? My point is that our Islamic scholars, from uh, the beginning to even uh, till the 7th and 8th century, they were classifying Islamic texts so that we can understand and classify. This is even before you're doing legal deduction, even before you're taking the hukum out of the text, even before you're taking hukum out of the ibara, you're classifying the ibara of how to read it and what is clear and what is not clear within the text itself. Now, let me give you another example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a little bit more tricky, but this is again, dalalatun nas. What the dalala, what the dalil of the nas is saying, what is the dalala, what is the point of the nasus? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْمُطَلَّقَاتُ يَتَرَبَّسْنَا بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُونَ the point of this text here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when a lady, she gets divorced, she needs to keep her to herself, meaning she'll stay in the house with, her, with the husband that's divorcing her for three months. For three months. And I'll come to this word too because this is a very interesting word. Thalath the qurun has different, uh, thalath the qurun has different meanings. But the point I'm trying to make here is is that we apply this not only for talaq, we also apply this for khula, we also apply this for many other cases because the illa, the point, illa is the effective cause of a text. So, illa is the reason the text is coming into, into existence. This is the illa or this is the reason why you're doing something. So because the illa is what? The illa is... Uh, uh, it is not allowed that they hide what Allah has put in their stomachs. So because that is the point of this three month period, that they will not hide what's in their, their, their pregnancy if they're pregnant. And to make sure that when they get married to somebody else, that that pregnancy, that there's no confusion in this for that reason. So therefore, whenever there is, uh, a divorce for any, any of the ways, whether it is through the qadi, whether it is through the, uh, the through khula or any other process, if they get separated, whether it is through talaq, uh, there will always be a three month period. This is the point I'm trying to make. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالًا يَتَامَ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا so over here it says those people who eat up the wealth of the orphans, they don't eat up anything, ex they're not putting anything in their stomach except for fire. But ya'kuluna, over here the apparent meaning is that you don't eat up the property of the orphan. Yes, this is the meaning too. But it also means, according to many great scholars, according to Imam Hanifa and so on and so forth, it also means mismanaging the money. Because ya'kuluna, those who eat the wealth of the orphan also means other aspects of it that relate to that word or that idea. The illa is, the purpose of the intent of the text is that the property of the wealth of the orphan should be safeguarded. So even if he was, uh, even if nobody stole the wealth, but if they mismanaged the wealth, the hukum is the same, meaning the point is the same. Those people who eat the wealth of the orphan unjustly. They put their in their stomach fire. They will be thrown into the hellfire. In the same way, here's a good example of Dalalatun Nas again. Allah says, Hurrimat alaykum The the list continues. Haram for you are your mothers. Meaning haram for you what? In marriage? And it doesn't say marriage, but it's understood what it's talking about. Haram for you is your moms in marriage. But it doesn't mean only your moms. It also means your mom's mom and, 
and if there's a mom's mom also. And in the same way with the entire list, it's understood that the what the intent meaning over here it's it's under it's not in the words, but the intent of the paragraph, the intent of the hukam goes not only to the mothers but the mother's mother and so on and so forth for, for that entire list same way. Then so Ibaratunas it's very clear. What is the intent? That you don't even have to explain it. It is what it is saying. Okay? And then Hishawatun Nas. Hishawatun Nas, again, it's clear, but it may be missing a word, but it's clear. Like the Prophet said, give them so they don't have to beg, meaning give the poor. It's understood. Then, there's Dalalatun Nas, which means that it's clear that the text it also means this. This is the point of the text. It, has to, it fits within the wisdom of the text which we call the illa of the text, the, the, the point. Why is this hukam being given? Why is this command being given? It's called illa, the reason. And I don't know, a lot of people think that Islam just gives commands and doesn't give us the reasons. There are very few commands in which Qur'an doesn't give us the reasons. Most of the time when Qur'an gives us a hukam, a command, it'll give us the reason. Very few times it will not. Like for example, for eating the swine, the pig. It doesn't give us a reason for not eating the swine. It just says haram. But for the other things, for a lot of other, even for salah, aqim as salat and dhikri, right? Establish the prayer for my dhikr. Sayyam, kutiba alaykum as sayyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la alla kunta taqun. Establish fasting so you can have my taqwa. Same thing for most of the ahkam, there is always an illa, there's always a purpose, there's always a function. And that's how you're able to, now again, that's going beyond the text. But that's how you're able to do qiyas. That's how you're able to make logical deduction. For example, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَحْلِكُوا, وَلَا تَحْلِكُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ بِأَيْدِكُمْ Do not kill yourselves with your hands. Do not kill yourselves with your hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this. So meaning, one is don't kill yourself with your hands, don't do suicide. Right? But when it says don't kill yourselves with your hands, does that also apply for smoking, for example? When it came down, there was no smoking. When this ayah came down, there was no smoking. Don't kill yourself with your hands, but is smoking, for example, a slow type of suicide? Now, I'm not giving the hukum if it's haram or not. That's a separate issue. I'm only saying that if you have alcohol, but you, you have drugs today that were not there at the time of the Prophet, how do you say what the hukum is? You have to make a logical deduction. How do you make the logical deduction? You make the logical deduction upon the purpose of why that law was given. The purpose of why that law was given is what helps you make that logical deduction that, okay, it was this was haram in the time of the Prophet for this reason, and we're doing something similar that's different but similar for the same reason, therefore it will have a similar hukam or something less. It'll, it'll never be more, generally speaking. It'll be something, for example, alcohol and then drugs. Right? So they had alcohol in the time of the Prophet. Khamar. Khamar means to cover. It covers your brain, covers your intellect. So if you do some, take something else that covers your intellect, like drugs, will it have the same hukum? Will it have the same ruling? So you're, what is the illa? What is the reason alcohol is prohibited? Because it covers your mind. Because it covers your thinking. And so you know the illa, you know the purpose. And so this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, uh, about the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He teaches them the book and the wisdom because the law is always subservient to the wisdom the law is always what? subservient to the wisdom the law exists because of its wisdom but but it's just like if at night at 3 o'clock there's a red light, you still have to stop. Even though, apparently, apparently, it's not completing the wisdom at that time because there's no cars. There's no cars, you can go, there wouldn't be an accident, you can see all the ways. But if there's a red light, you still have to stop because once the law is there, you have to follow the law. Once the law is there, but the law is subservient to the wisdom. And this is why, for example, 
Uh, inshallah, I will be giving khutbahs on the, the fatawas of the different sahabas, like the fatawas of Abu Bakr and Umar and the others. But, for example, in, amongst the fatawas of Umar was people that were stealing during the famine. He said, don't cut off their hands. Because the wisdom of that law would be negated if they cut off the hands if there's a famine. Right? So Omar said, don't cut off the hands during that time. So there is Ibaratun Nas, clear text. Hisharatun Nas, clear text, but maybe some words are missing, but the, the mafhum of the text is clear. Then there's Dolalatun Nas, and then there is Iqtidat Nafs, which is the, it's a required meaning. The required meaning is understood. And I'll give you some examples of that also. <coughs> Allah says, لِلْمُحَاجِرِينَ الْمُحَا... لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُحَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ And the ayah, إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ For the poor muhajirin, the immigrants, that were kicked out of their houses. So an example is, Allah says they're poor. But were they poor when they were in Mecca? No, they weren't poor in Mecca. But they became poor in Medina. So this is an example of, it's, 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 it's understood that the, what the intent of the verse is, but you have to allude a little bit more, you have to look deeper into it. Let me give you another example. Again, Allah has made the dead animals haram for you. But does that include dead fish? No. But here it says, dead animals are haram for you. All dead things are haram for you. The literal meaning. إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةَ All dead things are haram for you. But we know all dead things are not haram for us. For example, the things that are dead in the sea, you can eat them. So how, how do we know that, what is the text saying? So this is the issue. This is how you read, the, how you even read what it is, the point of the text is. What is the person trying, or here, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trying to convey to you so you can take out from it its real intent? Okay. Okay, also this same ayah. It doesn't say anywhere to eat. It doesn't say in this ayah to eat. Does it say to eat? No. But it means to eat. Indeed. It made haram. Maytata, the dead animal. For what? To eat. It's understood, but it doesn't say it. And so the point I'm trying to make is, who is who? There is a long history. There is a long, very rich history of looking at the Quran, particularly the legal texts, and to be able to classify. Okay, these ayat, they are, uh, they are, they are very clear. They are. They are very, uh, you know, they are very, uh, different scholars have used different words, but, you know, the, these ayat, ibaratun uh, nas, these ayat, dalalatun nas, these ayat, these ayat, they are of this category. And different, like Imam Shafi has a totally different categorization, which I'm not going to go into right now. Okay? You know, he would say this ibarat is sarihan, is clear, or ghayr sarihan. So different scholars have, or some would, some scholars would use the word mubham for something that's not clear, and and other words for that are clear. But the point is the same. Another example, for example, some scholars have talked about when is something uh, mufassar, and we call it mufassar, absolutely clear. For example, numbers, numbers are absolutely clear. So the laws of inheritance in the beginning of Sultan Nisa are very clear. We know what one-third is, we know what one-fourth is, we know what 80 lashes is, we know what numbers are. Very clear. There's no ambiguity about numbers. They are mufassif, they're clear. So, another example is, uh, there are many examples of mufassif, for example, hajj, salah, zakah, all these terms that are very common, they're understood, they're very, very clear. Khafi, something that's khafi, something that's hidden, an example of that is, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is interesting in Islamic law, this is actually an interesting case. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to cut off the hands of the thief. For the thief, male or female, cut off their hands. Does that mean if anyone steals anything? Okay, 
Let me ask you this question. This is actually interesting. Because if you read the books of Islamic law, oh my God, the questions they asked as lawyers, the, I mean, the discussions, I mean, it was, it was phenomenal, the discussions that these people had. For example, just on this ayah, there's a whole discussion of, okay, what is theft? Right? Then there's a question, okay, if you know somebody's a pocket picker, you know, he steals your wallet, right? Is that theft? Because you were, you, you were safe, because you were totally aware of what was happening around you, right? Is it theft if somebody steals out of a grave? Does that person legally own his property that he's wearing or he has in his grave? Does he legally own that? Is it his property in his grave? Is it going to be considered theft if it's somebody steals something out of a grave? I mean, I can go into so many details, but the scholars of Islam have, like, they have questioned every single word. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. But, uh, like, for example, the Hanafis would say, if a pocket picker, yeah. If he stole a certain amount, and again, remember, the cutting off the hands is for a white-collar crime, not for a blue-collar crime. You know what I'm saying? Somebody who's rich and then he steals. Like, the, you know, in Hollywood they do that all the time. You ever hear about that? You know, the, the Hollywood actresses will go into a store and try to steal something. These laws are for that situation. Not, uh, not I mean, again, I don't have time, but just as a side point, when uh, there was a lady, her, all, her name was also Fatima, and she was very rich, and she got caught in the time of the Prophet wasallam stealing. And they had come to the Prophet uh, to do, like, you know, can we, like, be lenient? And the Prophet says, if it was Fatima bint Muhammad wasallam, uh, even her hands would have been cut off, her hands will be cut off. It's for white-collar crime. It's not for, if somebody is poor and he's stealing, that's, that's not what the intent of the ayah is. The intent of the ayah is, in fact, one thing, a general principle about Islamic laws, criminal laws, Punishment, criminal punishment. A lot of scholars are in agreement, uh, and I can name the scholars, uh, but I won't do that. That the Islamic government will not take punishment for crimes of the civilian population until the Islamic government has given the people what it owes the people. Meaning what the right of the people is from the Islamic government. We, the Islamic government is not going to start whipping people and cutting off hands and cutting off whatever when the Islamic government itself has not provided for the people what are their rights. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi has talked about this. A lot of great scholars have talked about this. That there would be no implementation of criminal law until the Islamic government gives the people what is their right. Anyway. So, uh, sometimes the word is maybe uh, not so clear, like in the case of the theft. Who is the thief? What qualifies the thief? How much is this white-collar crime supposed to be? So on and so forth. Okay. Uh, sometimes the ayat, they have what we call in an ibarah, something is mushkil. Mushkil means it's difficult. Why is it difficult? Because it has more than one meaning. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, let the women hold themselves for three periods, does this period start with her purifying herself or when she starts her cycles? Does it start, meaning the three periods are based upon when she starts her cycles or when she purifies herself? There's two different meanings and two different opinions because of this ayah. So the point is, this is, uh, uh, again, another example that I'll give you. When Allah says, purify yourself, does it mean the outside or does it mean more than the outside? Okay, if it means only the outside, then why do we have to wash the mouth and the nose? You know how you, when you do ghusl, you wash the mouth and the nose. Is the mouth and the nose part of the face? This is also a question. Some scholars consider the mouth and the nose part of the face, and they consider far wajib. Just like, but most of the scholars say, no, the mouth and the nose is sunnah. But some scholars will say, the mouth and the nose is part of the face, so it's far. And Allah says, فَغْسِلُوا وُجُوهَكُمْ Wash your face. And that includes, you know, everything from this ear to this ear and from the lining of your hair to the bottom of your neck. But does that include what's inside your mouth? Does that include what's inside your nose? Or is that sunnah? How do you know? How do you know it's sunnah? How do you make these, these, uh, these uh, judgments? So there's a process. There's a way. And the first process is 
to be able to say, okay, this text is clear in what it's saying. This text is not so clear in what it is saying. This text is pretty much very clear to what it is saying. Before you even take out and extract any hukam, you have to be able to classify the text. What is the position of this text? Is it very clear or very unclear? And then when you add the sunnah of the Prophet to that, how much more clear does it become? How much less clear does it become? After adding the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to that text. Then, let me also, uh, let me also give you this example. This is, this is an example of, of iqtida uh, nas uh, where you have to make a logical deduction of what the verse is saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Ramadan, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيدًا and whoever is sick, أو على سفر, and whoever is traveling, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخْرٍ. So Allah says, let him complete it on other days. Now, does that mean if you're, if even if you're fasting and traveling, you have to complete it on other days? Because that's what the ظاهر of the text says. فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أو على سفر, فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخْرٍ. Let him complete it on other days. It means it's clear from the text, but it doesn't say it. It means that that person that's sick or the person that is traveling who has not fasted because they're sick or because they're traveling let them complete it on another group of days but the verse doesn't say that it just says if you're sick or if you're traveling complete it on other days and it's understood in the text it means that if you did not fast during those days again time is running out so Another very interesting uh, discussion in all of this, I'll end with this, is the issue of Am, uh, the, the general, versus the Khas. The general, and, and, and you know what is interesting, in the, one of the big dividers, the big dividers in fiqh, Abu Hanifa is on one side, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Ahmed bin Hamad on the other side. Imam, Shafi, Imam Abu Hanifa is big on, if there is a general principle, if there is a general principle, it's going to take a very strong dalil, a very strong proof, a very strong evidence for me to go against something general. Whereas Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, they're very open or more open to allowing taqsis, something specific to come in. Imam Abu Hanifa makes the general very strong that even if there's a dalil, even if there's a hadith that makes something specific different from the general, he won't budge. He, he, won't, he won't say yes very easily, unless there's a very strong proof. But Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, if there is a proof, they're more willing to accept the specific over the general. And Imam Hanifa is not willing to accept this specific over the general. Please come forward. And I'll just take two more minutes, and then uh, uh, we will, inshallah, finish. Um, come, come, come forward, come forward. Let me just give one example of the general versus the specific in the text of the Qur'an. Please come forward. <coughs> so, which one is general and which one is specific? The Qur'anic rule is you cannot eat animals that eat other dead animals, right? You all know this? You cannot eat animals that eat other dead animals. But the hadith of the Prophet makes it clear you can eat animals from water. And in water there are many animals that eat dead animals, like for example shrimps and clams. The Qur'an says don't eat animals that eat other dead animals. And the hadith says you can eat animals from the water. Which one is general? Which one is specific? If you say the general one is the one in Quran, you cannot eat animals under any, any, any circumstances. If the general is you cannot eat uh, animals that eat dead animals. And the specific is water. Then you'll say, okay, you can eat the shrimps. But if you turn it around, if you say the general is, you can eat anything in the water, but the specific is, the khas is, not animals that eat dead animals, then you'll say, okay, you can eat anything in the ocean except for the animals that eat dead animals. You come to a complete 
How do you decide which is Am and which is Khas? How do you decide when Quran is Khas and when Hadith is Khas? Or when Quran is Am or the Hadith is Am? How do you decide which is Khas, which is Am? Which is specific, which is general? And I mean, this is a very vast subject. I mean, and it is, and the reason I'm discussing this so that maybe you can appreciate that the, the, the mental work and anguish and the intellectual history that this is just only understanding what the ibarah, the, te the text is saying, only that. And this is not even taking the hukum out of it. How do you derive the legal, the actual deriving of the legal hukum is a complete different subject from what I'm talking about. But I hope, inshallah, this gives you, I'll give you one last example, last example. About general and specific. For example, Umar radiallahu anhu. One day, inshallah, I'm thinking maybe next week I might give a lecture on the fatawas of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu because his fatawas are so interesting and so different from the fatawas of Umar radiallahu anhu. It's very interesting how every Khalifa came and made fatawas that were opposed to his Khalifa before sometimes. And sometimes for good reasons, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Uh, Fatima bin Qais. The Quran says, the hadith of Fatima bin Qais is very famous. The Prophet ﷺ, the Qur'an says that when a woman is divorced, she will stay in the house of her husband for three months. Okay? For a certain time, three months and ten days. So when she is, she's going through divorce, she's in her husband's house. Fatiba bin Qais tells Umar bin Khattab and all the companions of the Prophet about an event in which the Prophet ﷺ allowed Fatima bin Qais to move out of the house into someone else's house. This situation goes to Umar radiallahu anh. Umar radiallahu is hearing it from Fatima bin Qais. But the general rule is the one in Quran. That's the general rule. And he is hearing this hadith from his habiya. He's not doubting her trustworthiness. But he doesn't accept it from her. He says, maybe you forgot to her. He says, maybe you forgot. Maybe you don't remember what happened. Because you're old. she was old. So he said this. And he didn't accept it from her. Because he says, the Quran says this. Why am I going to accept this? That was basically the attitude of Abu Hanifa also, uh, for the most part. But the point I'm trying to make is, what is the general, what is the specific? And there's always been a clash between the two in many instances in Islamic law. About 82% of all of Islamic law is the same. And then the other 18%, there's some differences, which is okay. But I was just trying to show you that how much exhortation and work, and because Arabs work, you know, we talk about them being great at language, but this was all about being great at language. Understanding the text was all about being great in language. Anyway, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhaban naq. Rabbana zalamna anfusna wa illam tafil lana wa tafhamna lana kunna minil khasirin. Allahumma taj'al khilafat al-muslimin fi hadhi al-ard. Allahumma ansur al-muslimin aina ma kanu wa haifu kanu wa ja'alna minhum. Allahumma fil lana wa rahamna اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد آمين اللهم آمين إن الله يعمركم بالأذن والإحسان وإيتاء القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر